Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Foltz and Company is made possible in part by Zatarain's authentic New Orleans style dinner mixes. Zatarain's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Louisiana, she's the exception and never the rule. She's a mystery that asks not to be solved, but simply to be experienced. Louisiana, Louisiana where you can come as you are and leave different. Additional funding is provided by the Friends of Louisiana Public Broadcasting and the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. How are you doing? Fine. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Approximately 175 miles from this meat case at Jacob's on Dew in Laplace, Louisiana, is the city of Lake Charles. There's a beautiful romantic revival home in that southwest Louisiana city built back in 1903. It's located in the Charpentier district, which consists of 20 blocks of historic homes and unique architecture. The building was completely renovated from the foundation to the roof in 1996. Over 600 hours of sanding was necessary to restore the pine floors and the stairway back to their original splendor. Even the moldings and rosettes have been reinstalled just as they appeared over 100 years ago. Now I can't begin to tell you everything that sets this B&B apart from others, but I will say that there's a dinner tonight in the English pub style dining room and it's my job to deliver one of the key ingredients for the entree. And here it is, fresh smoked on it, direct from Jacobs. I'm Chef John Foles. Join me as I travel through the swamps of Bayou Country and to the city of Lake Charles, Louisiana, to the Reed Turner House. Sportsman's paradise, the Louisiana motto is not camouflaged here at Reed Turner. In fact, Toby Cornell knew exactly what the Charpentier district needed when he decided to renovate this unique structure. No, y'all, not another Victorian B&B. He wanted a sportsman's getaway with just the right amount of flair. Hunting, fishing, and swamp tours in the Lake Charles area are just part of what this home offers to the guest. The dining room walls are paneled with wood from an 18th century English pub and decorated with hand-carved buffet ornaments. Y'all, they're so unique. Now tell me, what hunter wouldn't mind waking up in one of these four spacious bedrooms after a long day or a long night on the hunt? Y'all, this is what I call roughing it. Comfortable beds, air-conditioned, hard pine floors, and yes, there's even big screen TVs. In addition, there's period furniture here obtained from a great auction house in the Dallas area. Now don't fear, because there's plenty of room to tuck away all of that hunting gear in antique dressers like this beautiful one you're going to see right here in the corner. Ah, there it is. Look at that. You know, every amenity imaginable for the sportsman, regardless of the sport, is present in this hunting lodge. You want to relax on the porch as you wait for Toby to finish that great dinner, or you might just want to go into the kitchen and prepare it yourself. When Toby knows that I'm coming to town, he always says, hey, John, bring me something for the pot, and today I'm bringing on Dewey. Hey, John, come on in. Hey, Toby, exactly where I left you a couple of weeks ago at the stove. What are you making? I'm going to do a little gumbo here, John. I got uh, some uh, hunters, you know, that uh, came by and uh, 
Drop me off some pheasant. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. You're the luckiest guy in the world. Hunters coming in and leaving the remnants of the hunt for yeah, you to work right. with. Hey, that's all. Uh, well, so, so what kind of what kind of gumbo is it? That's going to be a pheasant gumbo, and I've got the uh, uh, you know nice dark mahogany color here on the roof. Oh man, that looks right. Pheasant gumbo. Now I never would uh, think of a pheasant gumbo, a real light meat, but uh, but I guess it'd be pretty good. Yeah, hmm? something new. Yeah, and, 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 and look at that roux, how gorgeous it is. Real nice mahogany color. Well, I tell you, you line that pretty doggone good. Well, you I had a good go. teacher. Hey, guess what I brought for you? Guess what I brought? You brought my undoey hey, from not, the river. Hey, not, not just undoey. I mean, I brought you the absolute best undoey. Take a look at that stuff, huh? That hey, right off the smokehouse. Oh, and it's got that pecan wood oh, smell to it. Oh, that fantastic pecan wood smell. So your roux's gone. What else are you going to do here? What well, are you I'm going to throw in? Actually, I'm going to throw in a couple of vegetables right now. Okay. And what are you putting in? I've got uh, onion, celery, uh, bell pepper, and garlic. Oh, all of those great traditional flavors. Yeah, boy, look how that thing pops. Good hot pot. That's a really nice. They're going to caramelize those vegetables real mm -hmm. nicely there. John, what did you ever do with those ducks that I gave you? Oh, those four wood ducks. You know... I think you just gave me a great idea here. Smelling that roux, and I picked up a little extra undoe. I think I'm going to go to my kitchen. I think I'm going to fire up a duck, oyster, and undoe gumbo. It looks like you have everything under control what about here. That, uh, what about that filet that you promised me? Oh, man, you know, I forgot about that good fresh ground filet. But look, I brought you the uh, undoe. I got an extra package for you to put in the freezer. I promise next time I'm going to go ahead and bring you a little bit of that fresh gumbo. On my next visit, save me some of that gumbo. Yeah, I'm sure I've heard that before. Y'all, you don't have to walk into Reed Turner with a shotgun or a hunting license in your hand. After all, that beautiful bed and breakfast is just as inviting to a honeymoon couple or someone looking for that little getaway in downtown Lake Charles. It's a magnificent home. The appointments are just fabulous. But the fact is that the home is just about 30 minutes from Cameron Parish, which has been voted one of the best hunting areas in all of the United States. And don't even talk about fishing, y'all. The Gulf of Mexico, the lakes, the greatest swamp land, bayous, rivers. My God, it is a fabulous spot. And Toby did get me in the mood to make a gumbo, so I'm starting uh, here in my black iron pot with a roux. In fact, I've been sitting here simmering that one cup of oil and one cup of flour into that gorgeous mahogany-colored dark brown roux, exactly as you saw in Toby's pot just a couple of minutes ago. And this is the base of our great gumbo. All the things that's going to give it that nice smoky Louisiana taste is right there in that cast iron pot. But look what I'm going to put into it. Take a look at this platter, y'all. Here's a couple of those little uh, wood ducks that Toby gave me. In fact, I took one and I smoked it. I smoked all four of them, actually. I put them over a little pecan wood for a couple of minutes and got that nice dark color in the duck. Take a look at that beautiful color. Imagine the smoke that's going to go uh, into the pot with that undue sausage. In addition to that, I'm going to put oysters into it because in Louisiana, we like to combine game as well as seafood. We have so much of it. Why not put them both into the pot? Then, naturally, the okra. You see uh, this little plant right here? Uh, this is found in most Louisiana gumbos. I'm not going to put it in this real hearty roux-based gumbo today because I'm putting filet powder into it, which I'm going to tell you about in just a minute because this is it right here. Look at this little uh, spice that we'll chat about in just a minute. And then, naturally, the andouille itself. And look how gorgeous this Jacob's uh, andouille is. Just a magnificent uh, product for the gumbo pot. So y'all, let's come on over and start the um, gumbo. I'm going to put into my roux about, oh, about a half a cup or so of a really nice uh, uh, diced onion celery bell pepper, which as you well know is the basis for all of our great Louisiana cooking. Onion, celery, bell pepper. And when these vegetables caramelize in the roux, the flavor is just incredible. Now, garlic, we cannot cook gumbo without garlic, and a lot of it, and put, as I say, a lot of garlic in the pot because the flavor of garlic comes from the oil, and it's going to evaporate right out of this pot with the steam if you don't put a lot in. So you love garlic, throw it in there, plus it's good for you, y'all. Oh, I wish you could smell this pot. Now, uh, into this, I'm going to throw some quartered pieces of my smoked wood duck. I have the breast, I have the, uh, mm, mm, I wish you could just 
smell all of that going in. The smoke, that pecan wood smoke is incredible. So I'm going to so simmer this around in the roux. And whenever I make gumbo, I love to put most of my flavors like the chicken or the duck or the, uh, some of the seafood, the shrimp or crab if I'm making a seafood gumbo, into the root to sacrifice it. The flavor is basically what I'm doing. But the duck takes a long time to cook, so naturally you would want to get it into the pot early. Now once that's in, I'm going to put a little bit of my oysters and oyster liquid because uh, you can only imagine the flavor that this is going to add to the pot, but I'm going to save some for right when this gumbo is ready to serve. I'm going to drop some in. And then y'all finally I'm going to add a touch of stock to this because we need a good duck stock or a good beef stock, a hearty stock. You could use chicken, but I'm uh, uh, making a little bit duck stock because I just happen to have some uh, bones from ducks that we have in old freezer. So I'm going to put in about, uh, you need about two quarts of stock to uh, thin out to the perfect gumbo consistency this uh, this roux, the roux needs to be thinned out to a nice soup consistency, and about two quarts of that stock would be just about right. Now, y'all, into this, I'm going to add my seasonings. So I could put some salt and pepper, which I'm going to do. I'm going to throw in just a little touch of Creole seasoning because I love the flavor of Creole seasoning, and then a little salt and pepper, as much as you like. Just kind of throw in some cayenne or black pepper, whichever one you like. I like them both, but I really like fresh ground black pepper in my gumbo. And then the secret ingredient, y'all, the one that's really going to bring out the flavor of this duck gumbo, and that's the andouille. And I've got some already sliced, and I want you to take a look at that nice, wonderful andouille going down into the pot. Now, y'all, as I throw this andouille in, I'm always talking about it. I'm always telling you that it's the premier seasoning meat in Louisiana. We can't cook anything, including dessert, without on doing it, but I don't think I ever told you how to make the stuff. So why not uh, come with me to Jacob's, the best place in the world to get on doing, and uh, let's take a tour of the process of getting this sausage to the table. Louisiana Andouille sausage is one of our gifts to the world. Having come to Bayou Country with the French back in 1699, or oh, y'all was it the Germans? Yes, once again, there's a food debate. The sausage is made by combining pork butt or shoulder with a variety of spices, including garlic, cayenne, pepper, and salt. The seasoned meat is then tumbled and ground into quarter-inch cubes. Y'all imagine this flavor. The meat is stuffed into the beef middle casings, which, as you can see, are much larger than other pork sausage. The links are tied into 18-inch sections, and now they're ready for that old Bayou Country smokehouse. The wooden smokehouses at Jacob's are about a century old and are fired with pecan or hickory wood. The undo is slowly smoked, y'all, for about eight or nine hours to produce a sausage unlike any other on the globe. Y'all, enjoy. And y'all, that's the way it's made in, uh, in Louisiana, in Laplace, Louisiana, in fact. And boy, what a flavor it gives to the pot. Now take a look at my gumbo. It's simmering away. I've added some green onions, some parsley, some bay leaves into it. And I'll let this simmer for about 45 minutes until the duck is nice and tender. And then I'm going to finish it right before I go to the table, y'all, with a little bit of this great herb right here, this great spice, ground sassafras leaves, or filet powder, as we call it in Louisiana. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that great flavoring in just a minute. But come on over here and let me show you what it looks like in the terrine when it's all said and done. Y'all, look at this gorgeous duck terrine here. Nothing better to serve gumbo in. Take a look at that, and I'll go ahead and pick up some of that duck and andouille gumbo for you to get a good view of it. Oh, look at all those pieces. And hey, and you want to put a little filet right down into it as you serve it at the table. Just a beautiful presentation for duck and andouille gumbo with oysters in it, y'all, and of course that great flavored andouille. Now the next dish that I discovered 
over at the Reed Turner House is a dish that I'm not quite sure whether it was a breakfast dish or whether it's an hors d'oeuvre or exactly what it is, but what a fantastic dish. And it's called Silver Queen Corn and Tarragon Egg Roll. It's actually an omelet, but it contains all of these wonderful ingredients that you see here on my, on my board. I have some Silver Queen Corn, which I think is some of the sweetest and lightest color corn. It's almost like the old shoe peg corn of Louisiana. And then we flavor this uh, omelet or roll omelet with a little bit tarragon, which is perfect with eggs, and a little bit cream cheese and a couple other things. I want to show you how to make it. Let's come on over to my little skillet here. I'm going to put a touch of olive oil. You could use butter, or you could use a buttery flavored oil in this if you wanted to, but I'm going to put a little olive oil because I think olive oil goes really nice with uh, eggs as well. Into that, I'm going to throw some of this beautiful Silver Queen corn, y'all. Just kind of Simmer that around for just a second. And, uh, and you don't want to worry too much about, uh, uh, this is already cooked, obviously, so you want to just kind of heat it all up. Tarragon, beautiful tarragon. I'll put a little touch of that in. Some red bell pepper. You can even put yellow bell pepper, orange, kind of just put a lot of your own flavors in here, y'all. It's going to be great. Some chives, put a little touch of chives, because this is the stuffing for the omelet, believe it or not. The roll omelet uh, needs a stuffing, so we're gonna make it right here with the corn and then cream cheese. Just kind of melt that cream cheese away down into the bottom of that pan. It's gonna melt very, very quickly. And then, y'all, you even want to add a little bit whipping cream to this to create the finished stuffing. Just a little bit whipping cream down in there to kind of keep it all nice and melted away and kind of keep it nice and juicy, and then flavor it. Salt and pepper, it's got all the herbs in it already. Look how that's all melting away. And then go ahead and season it with your favorite seasoning again. Salt, pepper, whatever. I'll let this sit here for just a second because I want to show you how to actually make the omelet, y'all. And let me clear my little board off here. In, a, a, in a, a sheet like this, I have. you can see that I've put some parchment paper down in here because I want to put the omelet on top of this so it rolls out of the oven evenly. But I have eight eggs in my, board, in my little bowl here. Just kind of whisk those around quickly like that. And whenever you're making an omelet, you can choose for yourself whether you're gonna put a lot of milk or cream into it. I love to put cream in my eggs because I think it lightens it up and it kind of strengthens them a little bit too, but not too much, y'all. If you put too much in there, you're gonna be in trouble. It's gonna make your eggs watery. So blend that around and then a little touch of Creole seasoning, salt, pepper, tarragon. Just, again, repeat your herbs into the eggs and season it nicely, as much spice as you'd like. And then, y'all, into this baking pan. Look at here. I'm going to pour it right on top of this pan. You can see all of those flavors coming together nicely. And then you level it off and put it into about a 350 degree oven for about eight minutes on one side. Flip it around eight minutes on the other. I want to show you what it looks like when it comes out of that oven because it's so simply done. Look at this. It's almost like a sheet of crepes. You see that? Very, very interesting uh, presentation here with all the flavors. Now y'all have to put all of this nice hot uh, filling. So come on over to my skillet and I'm going to take this nice filling of the Silver Queen corn and follow me here, y'all. I'm going to spread it out across the omelet. Just kind of spread it out nicely all over there like this. Oh, my, this is great. And just kind of get it edge to edge. I think you have the general idea here. And come back and put more flavoring on top of it if you'd like. Just more herbs, more seasoning, whatever you want to do to jazz it up a little bit. And, y'all, this is the key here now. You want to roll it up. So just kind of pick up the paper. That's why you have to have this paper nice and, uh, look at that, just kind of keep moving it around just like that until this omelet is all rolled up. See that? A little complicated, but I think you can find out that it's simple to do if you follow the instructions. And take a look what it looks like when it's all said and done over here, y'all. In fact, I'm going to put a little bit tomato sauce around the edge. And y'all, let me tell you a little bit about a couple other dishes I found at the Reed Turner house. First, take a look at this great little board of Mallard sausage, y'all. Now, not only do I have the fresh Mallard sausage, I have the smoked Mallard sausage as well. And this is about equal parts of Mallard duck breast combined with seasoned pork and then put into a pork casing. And what do we do with it? Well, we can 
pan saute it like I'm doing here and serving it as an hors d'oeuvre, or I can, of course, put the smoked uh, uh, Milo duck sausage right into a gumbo as I did on Dewey a couple of minutes ago, and it is just as good. I love this with a little bit of that great spicy Creole mustard in Louisiana. And y'all, I want you to take a look at this pie. This pie is a chess pie, but you'll notice that it's a chocolate chess pie. The early chess pies of Louisiana were mainly a, a, a kind of buttermilk and cream cheese, and everybody was kind of sick and tired of those pies. But we transformed it uh, by adding chocolate to it. The name, a lot of people can't quite figure out where the word chess pie comes from. I think it came from the fact that it sat in one of those old pie safes in Louisiana, the chest on the back porch, and that's where that name comes from. Well, y'all, I told you just a couple of minutes ago about filet powder, that secret little flavoring in all of our gumbos in Louisiana. Well, it is one of the best kept secrets that we have from the rest of the world. And there's a place on Essen Lane here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, that's called the Rural Life Museum. It's part of the LSU system, and it's one of these folkways museums that kind of show you everything about early ways in Louisiana. And you see this little implement here, no plantation kitchen could get along without this. I'm, uh, why don't we take a, a walk over there and uh, David Floyd, the curator, is going to tell us not only about this, but about the art and science of making great filet powder and even the history and origin of that great dish. As I said, a Louisiana secret. David, there's a, a lot of uh, folklore and myth about sassafras root and sassafras leaves, and I'm here in search of the story of filet powder. <laughs> How did we get it into the kitchen anyway? It actually comes from the Native Americans here in the United States. As early as uh, 1574, Dr. Nicholas Menendez discovered that the Indians, the Native Americans, were using it as a thickening agent in their broths and their venison soups. And he also found out that they were using it as, uh, for medicinal purposes, for salves and, and cure-alls. And he really started exporting it to the Europe, and it uh, became uh, this country's oldest commercial crop. Is that right? I, I would have never known that. Now, I always heard that the Choctaw Indians of Louisiana gave it to the early, early colonists, and they were using it more uh, as a, uh, for burns and for scratches and all of this. Is that right? I never heard that they use it uh, culinary. Well, of course, the French, when they came to Louisiana, uh, did discover the same attributes of the, of the sassafras leaves themselves. And yes, they would take a leaf and add moisture to it and use it as a salve. A lot of times, if they had a, a um, problem with their mouth, tooth disease or whatever, they would chew on it. Mm -hmm. And it really became a cure-all. And, and if you remember your grandmother thinking sassafras tea would you know, uh, just cure all these <laughs> things. And, that carries on down today. Now, now you know, I, you mentioned sassafras tea. I remember vividly my grandmother and even my mother taking the, the root of the sassafras tree and boiling it, and that's where our uh, root beer came from. Exactly. And th what they would do is they would chop the root off and then uh, take the bark off the root. And the Indians actually thought the bark of the root was the best part of the, of the, of the uh, sassafras root, but the, it was the inner part of that that they would make hard candy out of and root beer and other things. Now, now tell me about the flavor. That, uh, I'm sure most people who hadn't experienced filet or ground sassafras leaves wouldn't know what it tasted like. Describe that flavor. For someone who's never had it before, it has a texture and somewhat of a flavor like thyme. Is it, but it doesn't taste like thyme. It, it really enhances the dish without taking any of the flavors away from the onions and the meats and such in our gumbos. And it really gives a wonderful color and uh, yeah. deep, um, rich color to your, to your soup and you, to your broth. You know, you mentioned that, but you really can see a gumbo that sassafras has been added to because it gives it that dark, swarthy color that we come to love in, uh, in gumbo. And of course, when I get a bowl of gumbo, the first thing that happens is I start looking for the velo. <laughs> <laughs> now, when and how are the uh, leaves harvested? Well, actually, you would get a branch of leaves. Late August is the best time. And you're really looking for the young leaves, such as this one here. Right. And you would pluck it off. And taking a pilon or a pile or mortar and pestle, they would take these leaves after drying them for a day or two. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What was the name of that? Well, this is called a pilon and a pile. And you remember your, uh, when you were in trouble, somebody said, I'm going to pile you. <laughs> That's where that term comes from. That's where this old term comes from. <laughs> and what we would do is put the leaves in this uh, old pilon pile and then just grind them. And after grinding them, 
to a, to a powder, you would sift them and then grind again and sift until you end up with a and very fine powder. You would end up with something just like this, a really nice, and, I, and I've put it in my fingers here, a nice powdery, uh, oh my God, this is one of the best uh, kept secrets in Louisiana, no doubt about it. Well, David, thanks a million for uh, share, or I, I should say exposing that secret. <laughs> we really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Well, a pleasure to have you here. And, and you know, one other thing. I have a friend of mine in Lake Charles, Louisiana, who, uh, said that I had to bring him a bottle of filet. And of course, I need one for myself, for my own kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, how much do you charge for that bottle? Well, I don't know. This is pretty rare stuff, you know. Oh, my God. Here we, here we, here we go. <laughs> Price gouging. We'll, we'll we discuss do. that in a minute. Y'all, thanks so much for stopping by as we continue to visit the bed and breakfasts of the Bayou State and cook up more great taste of Louisiana. What about a couple bucks a bottle? <laughs> To learn more about A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Folson Company, visit PBS online at the internet address on your screen. Hot beignets and warm boudoirs by Chef John Folson is available for $29.95. This companion book to the series features over 150 recipes. To order, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen. Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Fultz and Company is made possible in part by Zatarans Authentic New Orleans Style Dinner Mixes. Zatarans, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Louisiana, she's the exception and never the rule. She's a mystery that asks not to be solved, but simply to be experienced. Louisiana, Louisiana where you can come as you are and leave different. Additional funding is provided by the Friends of Louisiana Public Broadcasting and the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. <laughs>